Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I'm Jesse Collings, joined, as always, with Jason and Priscer. Um, Today, we wanted to do something with WrestleMania, and we kind of debated it uh, last time we chatted what we were going to actually do. Um, and so we, I, I kind of borrowed a concept from Voices of Wrestling um, where they would take, like, kind of suggested, they would suggest matches to each other, and we'd watch them, like, old matches, And so I figured we could do that with WrestleMania. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about four matches from the past uh, in WrestleMania history that we both watched over the last week. And so we didn't really, like when we were talking about it, I was like, we're not going to have like any real standards for what matches we're going to choose. We're just going to pick matches that might be kind of interesting to watch. Um, so the matches that we settled on, and we, we did tweet this out on our Twitter account last week, um, so I hope maybe some people listening have, have recently watched the matches as well, or they just remember them all, which is also a factor. But so we chose Hulk Hogan versus Sid, so, which was Sid Justice at the time. So Hulk Hogan versus Sid, which was the main event at WrestleMania 8. Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg in their infamous match from WrestleMania 20. Money, money in the Bank match from WrestleMania 21. That's the first Money in the Bank match. And then Ted DiBiase Jr. versus Cody Rhodes versus Randy Orton from WrestleMania 26. Um, and so I guess before we get into any of the matches, Jason, do you want to tell us which of those matches you chose and kind of why you picked them? Yeah, so... Um... The matches I chose from my recollection was the Money in the Bank ladder match uh, from WrestleMania 21. Um, Just more of like, you know, I I think the Money in the Bank concept, it's an annual pay-per-view now. It's its own premium live events. Um, And so, you know, we're kind of just used to these matches coming in every year. And so I think it's always worth looking back on sort of, um, you know, the beginnings of the match and see how it's changed or how much it stayed the same over the years. I, I wrote like some of my notes like, oh, you know, here's this cliche, here's that cliche of what they, you typically see in Money in the Big Ladder matches, but you know, they're doing this for the first time. Uh, we'll get more into the participants because that's really interesting as well. Just look back on like, okay, who they, who they choose to be in this first match. Um, I also picked the the triple tri- triple threat, uh, three-way legacy um, match, Master Ma- WrestleMania 26. Um, you know, looking at back at Cody Rhodes at his beginnings before all the tattoos, before uh, he really changed his style, where I think it's always interesting now because nowadays when you get have a Cody Rhodes match, you typically understand what a Cody Rhodes match is going to be. Um, he has, you know, typical sort of moves. He really likes that um, old school, you know, Southern uh, style, NWA style. But um, looking back at his beginnings, is very different uh, than what it was now as a wrestler. And so I think just looking back at the beginnings of, you know, different wrestlers and different, um, you know, match types is, I think it's always very interesting to look back on and really informs um, current wrestling today. So, you know, look back at the past and just learn from that and see what's sort of stuck around and what's sort of, you know, been dated o- over the years. Yeah, I know we kind of bartered back and forth about what we were going to do for that last match because I think we wanted to do a Cody match because obviously it appears he's coming in for, for, for this year's WrestleMania. We'll see exactly what happens. Um, And we like, he doesn't really have like a good WrestleMania collection of matches. His only singles match, his one-on-one match is against big show, which is that match, which was a tables match, which Cody Rhodes wins when like big show, like accidentally steps on a table and breaks it. (laughs) Um, So this is a more, this one at WrestleMania 26 is a more interesting match Um, for a lot of reasons. It's more interesting than I thought it was going to be when I, when I actually watched it. Um, And so I picked, um, I picked Sid versus Hogan and let's start with that. We'll go in chronological order. So we'll start with, with Sid versus Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania eight. Jason, I'll start for first. Have you ever seen this match before? before I told you to watch it. I've only seen this match one time, and that's just mostly because I've heard, you know, the infamous sort of Sid kicks out of Hogan's leg drop um, finish and the whole, you know, Papa Shango um, sort of thing. And so like, I've heard, uh, 
I, I initially heard the stories behind that, that Papa Shango infamously, you know, came in late. Um, you know, I guess the idea was he's supposed to, you know, break, you know, distract Hogan or, you know, have some type, type of interference so that, you know, um, no, no one would kick out of the leg drop since no one, that's, that's no one kicks out of the leg drop. It's Hogan's finisher. Um, and so I heard those stories before and so that informed me uh, to watch this match. But it's been a while since I've watched uh, this match here and it's really interesting. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if we planned this, but it's interesting the first two matches we chose were literally just two guys staring at each other, doing mostly nothing. And, <laughs> and, 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 and but, but in the first match, it's received very well and we'll get to it later. But the second match, it's not very received really, very well. It's, so it's kind of interesting, those contrasts there of guys pretty much doing the same, similar things, but one is more received very well. Yeah, and that's a broader point I wanted to get in with this match. Um, watching this match objectively, and one of the reasons I wanted to for us to, to talk about it, and it, it's the worst WrestleMania main event ever from like a functional standpoint as far as like, is the match good? Other people have told me that um, that like Hulk Hogan versus Yokozuna at WrestleMania 9 is like a worse WrestleMania main event, which I understand the argument for that, but that's not really a match. It's more of almost like a segment. Yeah. Um, this was a hyped match, and when I'm watching it, uh, my main thought at the end of it was that wrestling can never be like this ever again, <laughs> because so much of this match is so poorly executed and boring, and yet it was a tremendous success. They drew a huge crowd to the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis. The crowd is crazy into this match. You mentioned it. Like in this match, they basically do a super long test of strength and the crowd's really into it. And then, you know, flash forward 12 years for the Brock Lesnar Goldberg match and the crowd craps all over it. Yep. And it's like people want like wrestling to be the way it used to be. Certain fans, especially fans that were kids during time periods like the late 80s, early 90s, they want wrestling to be the way it used to be. And they miss that kind of energy that like a Hulk Hogan match would have. And when you watch, it's true. It's like, there's really not too many matches now that have this kind of energy, that have this kind of crowd investment. But it's just, it's such a different fan base. It's such a different time period. The expectations are so different for what fans want in a wrestling that we can never go back to something like this. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's kind of surprising. This was in 1992 and Hogan is still um, very over. And I think, yeah, I think the general narrative was that Hogan's uh, um, luster was fading into the 90s. And, you know, looking at this main event, that wasn't really that true. I mean, people were still very much into Hogan, even into 1992. Um, and of course, you know, like, I'm sure you, you've, uh, I think you wrote this down in your notes, but like, yeah, like Hogan obviously takes a break during this due to the steroid trial and, you know, lots of other things go on behind that there. But it's also interesting that, you know, this match could have been Hulk Hogan against Ric Flair. Um, I guess that was the original idea for the main events. Um, and then the, this whole WrestleMania is booked as a double main event. However, the Savage Ric Flair match for the WWF title was like in the middle of the card. And so it's like, that's a weird sort of framing as a double main event, uh, sort of for this event here. Um, and yeah, like also part of my notes, um, I think um, it, 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 there's like a moments where um, Bobby Heenan um, is like, you know, being a heel, ragging on Hogan. And, you know, Gorilla Monsoon um, answers right back is like, why, why don't you just sit quiet and enjoy it? And I feel like that's the sort of the mentality of this match here for a lot of like the older fans. Uh, like when we get, wherever you were, if you were to rag on this match objectively in terms of match skills, you know, people would just say, just sit back and enjoy, you know, the whole atmosphere of the Hoosier Dome, just going crazy for everything that Hogan does, you know, Sid and Hogan. Uh, anytime the crowd makes a noise, you know, they're just looking around in the crowd. And, you know, it is a typical wrestling thing you still see nowadays. And it makes sense. You're feeding off the crowd um, there. But it's just an, an over-aggressive amount of that the whole time. Right. So, look, when you look at when, the big story of the WrestleMania 8, right, is that Ric Flair comes into the company in late 1991. And... The obvious dream match was Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan. 
And in hindsight, you know, as we look back on this match and people think about wrestling in the 80s, they always ask the question, how come this match, Rick Flair, what the main event of this show is not Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan? And the explanation for that, as Dave Meltzer has, has mentioned many, many times, because it's probably the most frequently asked question he ever gets, yeah. um, is they did Hogan versus Flair on house shows, I think in late 1991, to see you know how they were going to draw. And they didn't really draw that well. And I think it's hard for people to go back in time, but the WWF fan base of the early 90s was largely not aware of other types of wrestling and didn't really view Ric Flair as this iconic figure that we as fans of later generations and, and fans now looking back and say, well, of course, Hogan and Flair, they're the two icons of the 80s. How is that not a huge title program? But to the fan base at the time, it was like, who's this, you know, Ric Flair is like this old looking guy with white hair. Um, granted, you could scrap Hogan as that as well, but... Um, <laughs> There was more, the, the, the Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan story was really not a story that WWF wrestling would tell at the time. Now, a giant muscle-bound blonde guy coming in and beating up Hulk Hogan, that was the story that, that the, that fan base would gravitate towards. And so it's really hard to, um, to, you know, think that looking back on it. But the fact is, is that Hogan versus Sid was a bigger program at the time for the WWF. Um, it drew better. It had more momentum. It was the main event on this show. You know, it was the first WrestleMania to not have uh, the world title as its main event, with the exception of WrestleMania one, which, you know, obviously was the tag team match. But, you know, Hogan was the champion in that match. So yeah. but this was the first time where I feel like a match was bigger than the world championship match at WrestleMania. Um, and so you have all of that leading up to this match. Now, the other aspect of this, which is a funny, it's, it's funny in hindsight, is that this match was kind of booked and billed as this potential Hulk Hogan retirement match. If you watch the match, there's a, a sad Hulk Hogan promo where he's doing this like very quiet sit down interview with yeah. Vince McMahon. And it's not the typical Hogan, like sweating and staring into the camera and saying all his catchphrases. It's like, you know, supposed to be like, this is Terry Balala, you know, cutting is talking about how he doesn't know if his career is going to be over. I don't really know why, like the impetus for like why Hulk Hogan is retiring. Like if he's afraid of Sid or he's just like tired and bored, like I don't really get into that. It's just kind of like Hulk Hogan is going to retire, you know, perhaps. And so they kind of sell this match around the idea of it being Hulk Hogan's potential last match. Um, and so that's like, in a lot of ways, that maybe is this major angle for the show is not as much Hulk Hogan versus Sid, but that this is, could be Hulk Hogan's last match. And the interview is really funny if you watch it because it's super sincere and Vince McMahon's like, just want to tell you, thanks for the memories. Yeah. Thank you for the Hulkamania. <laughs> like, it's really funny. There's a lot of humor in this, like if you watch it with like a cynical eye. Yeah, um, I mean, right away, like Vince, he into the, one of the first questions is like, "Oh, is this going to be your last match?" And Hulk Hogan's answer was, "When you ask that question, it makes me sweat." Like, what? What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, it makes you sweat. Like, aren't you like sweating like twenty four seven most days anyway? It's well, like just a weird answer to that question. <laughs> well, here's the thing about Hogan. Hogan's promo style is all about delivery. It's yeah, exactly. not about his actual words and substance. Now, he was he's a great promo in his own way. Some people will go back and say, like, Hogan is a bad promo, and that's not really true. No. But he's very specific promo style, which is all about the delivery and is like, here's my 45-second promo. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's all my catchphrases. Here's, look at my intensity. Look at my muscles. Like, it's it's perfect for its time. It's it's what got him really over. Yep. But when you put him in this kind of setting and he's, like, just sitting in, like, a like a daytime talk show, like, like, um set up and he's being serious and he's not you know all jazzed up and he's kind of just left with his words and it doesn't have any of the delivery it's yeah. very weird um so this match now the big thing for me as like a technical standpoint in this match when i watch it um is i think when people when people think of sid like as a performer um 
I have like little use for him personally, but I know a lot of people, especially people who grew up watching him. And I got in this argument with a lot of people when I was like, Sid sucks. Is that Sid is like this master squash wrestler, right? Sid is this huge guy that's supposed to go out there and he's power bombing and press slamming all of these like 180 pound jobbers. And he looks like a million bucks. And it's like, holy crap, look how big this guy is. Look how powerful he is. And, and that was, you know, a lot of wrestling on television were those kind of matches um, in a way that they, they're not today. So like a guy who's really good at them comes across like a big star. But in this match where he, you know, he's wrestling Hulk Hogan, who he's not going to be able to just ragged all around, A, because Hogan's huge, and B, because it's a main event. It's a main, he has to have like a main event match. He can't just do a squash. Yep. Um, his offense is like non-existent in this match. It's so bad. Like there's a world where this match is okay because Sid kind of just, you know, he's power slamming Hogan and he's throwing him into the ropes and hitting him with the clothesline. And he's, he's doing all these kind of like basic 80s style power wrestling. Um, but he doesn't do any of that. We have the long test of strength. We have this, you know, the submission segment where Sid like grabs like Hogan's trap, you know, trapezius muscle and just holds it for like, I don't know, two or three minutes. A, a, a nerve hold. Yeah, it's like a nerve hold. And I was watching, I was like, why is this, like, can Sid not do a fucking full Nelson? Like, why is, <laughs> why is he just, like, holding on to, 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 to Hogan's, like, neck with, like, two hands? And, like, we're supposed to believe that Hogan's going to pass out from it. And then, and then he does, like, these, he keeps doing these, like, crappy kicks. Like, these, like, white belt Taekwondo kicks <laughs> that come across super awkwardly. And I was just like, Man, there is nothing to this match. Yeah, I mean, it was just love meandering, and I, I think maybe, I, like, like Sid came into this, like there was a, a promo beforehand with me, Gene, and um, Sid. He's talking about how he, oh, I'm gonna end you, Hulk Hogan. You know, I'm gonna, you know, beat you down, and like you kind of got that in the beginning of the match where Sid attacks. Hogan in the beginning, but like Hogan fights it off and, you know, then we get into the whole test of strength and the rest of the match there, but still, like, there was very little sense of urgency uh, mm -hmm. to Sid, um, especially since, like, you know, the idea was, I guess, he was going to end Hogan's career by beating him down so bad, and you kind of got that a bit, you know, but, like, just before that, he, like, he was working the lower back of Hogan. It's like, okay, he's gonna put him in, the, you know, work that area, but then, yeah, he does a nerve hold for whatever reason, um, uh, I, I guess because he's so stronger than Hogan, but then like it just all serves as fodder for the Hogan comeback, where you know he's you know hulking up and all that stuff there. That seems to be the main purpose of the match, and everything else was just you know feeding off the crowd. And it's just you know they know that whatever they do, the crowd is going to eat it up anyway, and so they might as well just do nothing. Is what I, seems like what the, what their goal was. Yeah, you're right about the lack of sense of urgency. The story is not as much as like. Sid is just viciously beating Hulk Hogan, which would be more entertaining. It's more of like a Sid is so confident that he doesn't have to like be like that urgent when he's fighting Hulk Hogan. Like he cuts a promo mid match. He like looks right into the camera, yep. gets up on the apron, he looks right into it, and him and like Harvey Whippleman like cut a whole promo in the middle of the match. <laughs> he was a uh, he's ahead of his time. He would have done good in the Thunder Thunderdome era. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he and it, it, it is like um. You know, it is the story here is like Hogan sells a lot in this match in a way that like he really doesn't like he would he would like if you watch some of his matches on Andre the Giant, he'd kind of sell like that. But even if you watch his match against Ultimate Warrior, you know, WrestleMania six, it's the selling like Sid does like one move and Hogan like acts like he died. Like it's it's kind of awkward selling, but it's like clearly supposed to be like that Hogan has no chance to beat this guy because this guy is the superior version kind of of Hulk Hogan. And that's a real message because if you look at it, like, you know, when they're doing the stare down, Sid, it, he's taller than Hogan. He's more muscular at this point of his career than Hogan is. He does kind of feel like, like this evolutionary version of Hulk Hogan. I didn't really see that. Like Warrior is kind of similar to Hulk Hogan, but that Sid has a better look than Hogan does. Um, and I don't think really anyone really had that at that time period that if you look at like Hogan's major opponents, Hogan kind of is always Hulk Hogan and versus some lesser guy, unless it's like Andre the giant in this version, it really does feel like it's like, okay, we have, you know, 
the Hulk Hogan is the 1.0 model, and now the 2.0 model is here, and it's Sid. Yeah, especially if you compare it to like last year's Mania, where um, Hogan was going up at Sergeant Slaughter, like it's pretty much a complete 180 um, mm-hmm. from Sid, uh, Sergeant Slaughter to Sid. And so, yeah, it definitely makes sense. Like you look at the context of that time of why Sid would get a main event push um, against Hogan. Um, and yeah, like he was definitely imposing and, you know, it, it, it definitely le- 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 leads to, it makes you understand why um, Sid was Hogan's opponent. But, you know, um, I don't know if you, you want to get to the, the ending of the match, the finish. Yeah, no, so, talk yeah, about the, it. yeah, the finish of the match is very strange. You know, like Hogan does his um, hulking off. He does the comeback. He does a leg drop and uh, he kicks out because uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess the, the story is that Papa Shango is supposed to come out and interfere in some type of way leading to a DQ finish. Uh, but instead, um, Harvey Whippleman steps up to the apron. Hogan, you know, handles him and the ref rings the bell right away very quickly i think very uh, too quick as you mentioned um in your notes but like it, it seems to be too quick that they ring the bell um but yeah at least a dq finish papa shango finally trots out you know he's like jogging or maybe he is running in his sense um but yeah he's jogging out to the ring um the heels double team hogan ultimate war comes back because i forgot about this in 1991 um ultimate warrior had his scuffle with uh vince mcmahon wf uh over SummerSlam, and so warrior does come back in 1992 um to make the save of hogan you know they fight off sid and uh, papa shango and you know the, they celebrate in the ring that's sort of how um russell mina finishes which you know i think nowadays if they did that kind of finish it would be a riot you know people would you know you know, cancel your W network subscription, you know, da, da, you know, cancel your subscriptions. Uh, but everyone was happy, you know, they left home happy because uh, Warrior was still, you know, over at that time. And so people just enjoyed seeing Hogan Warrior in the ring together. Yeah, I mean, the, the finish is awful for everything you relayed. The, the big thing is the timekeeper rings the bell too early. Yeah. Like the timekeeper rings the bell when Hogan punches Whippleman. And so at first I'm like, wait, do they disqualify Hulk Hogan for punching the manager, which typically is not a disqualification, but we've seen matches where that does happen. Um, and then later, like Gorilla Monsoon kind of clarifies that Hulk Hogan won via DQ because Papa Shango ran and interfered, which is true, but the bell rang far before Papa Shango ever hit the ring and hit Hogan. So it just comes across as really confusing. And you're right, like if they did this today, I mean, it would be everything about this match, really, if they did this today. If they did as little as they right. did, it'd be ripped <laughs> to shreds. If they did a DQ finish, it would be ripped to shreds. Um, it, it's just, it's one of those things, like I said, wrestling can never be like this ever again. Um, you know, if Hogan, you know, Hogan takes Sid's powerbomb is like the one move Sid actually does in this match. And right. Hogan like immediately hulks up because remember, Jason, that people always sold back then. No one ever no <laughs> sold anything ever. Um, you know, that would probably cause a, a, a week long Twitter debate if, if Hogan, you know, if Hogan didn't sell the powerbomb uh, or maybe not because it was WWE. But everything about this match, you know, it comes across in a- ages poorly. But wrestling is all about time and place. In its time, it worked very effectively. Um, I, I, you know, it was something that really got over. Like I said, Warrior gets a huge pop when he comes out. Everyone's happy to see Hogan and Warrior at the end of the match. Um, the big thing is like they just there's zero mention of like, oh, was this the last time we saw Hulk Hogan? You know, is right. this Hogan's last match? Like, as soon as the match is over and Warrior comes out, everyone's like, oh, this is great. We love Hulk Hogan. We love Ultimate Warrior. Good night, everybody. And like, I'm like, <laughs> well, the match was kind of built around. We'd find out if like this is Hogan's last match or not, but they don't even mention it. They don't even say like, oh, we'll have to find out if this is actually Hogan's last match. Tune in, you know, for our next event or like stay tuned for more. It's like, just like they completely <laughs> forget about what the match was about. It's like the, uh, the, the Shane McMahon Undertaker Hell in a Cell match. Or like as soon as the match was over, like everyone just forgot about like that storyline that was going into the match and everyone right. moved on with their lives. <laughs> um. It's like they don't even mention any of it. Uh, Dave Meltzer gave this match negative two stars and wrote, Sid is like a Christmas present with the world's greatest wrapping paper, but the box is empty. Um, 
people think Dave is mad, is like mean now. Like, ah, Dave now. So he's just like this mean guy who writes this his newsletter. Dave is like a million times meaner in the old newsletters. Like he's, he doesn't pull any punches. I mean, he never dusts out the negative star rating anymore. So for you to get a minus two stars, um, it, you know what? I have no complaints. It's everything, everything. It's, this is not a, this is not a, 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 a good wrestling match. Uh, Sid is not look good in this match. I, I, I fully agree with Dave on this one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he was more uh, willing to give negative stars back then uh, than he is now. I think, you know, at worst, you'll get a one star or maybe half a star, but like never a negative, which I don't know if it's indicative of like, hey, you know, wrestling is a bit better nowadays than back then, uh, perhaps, since like you rarely get these kind of matches nowadays. Mm-hmm. And so maybe that's why there's no negative stars anymore. But like, uh, you know, definitely um, deserving of a negative star since this, well, this was barely a match. It was half a match. Um, basically um the first half is just nothing and then a test of strength is not you know objectively what you would want in a wrestling match but again for the time you know people what ate everything up and so i guess you know they did their job i think um the buy rate the buys they did was three hundred sixty thousand uh buys which um you know was pretty decent back then um obviously um the next next wrestlemania um was not that great uh compared to uh wrestling like eight but you know that's just sort of another story yeah it, it did well from a business standpoint you know you have to talk you have to realize that we're coming off of wrestlemania 7 which was in los angeles which was originally supposed to be at the la memorial coliseum or maybe the rose bowl i can't remember but it was supposed to be at like a big stadium it's supposed to be like this hundred thousand person event and the ticket sales were so bad that they ended up moving it to, I think, the LA Auditorium. Um, and so, like, you're coming off. That was a WrestleMania the previous year. The fact that they were able to successfully run a stadium show the next year is 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 a is, is a sign of positivity. Um, yeah, it's like just one of those things that I think, uh, like, if if this was a match happened today, I think Dave would give it like two stars. Like he's definitely not giving a negative star. He would just be like, ah, it was kind of a lame match, but they uh, you know, the crowd was into it or whatever. Like he's 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 an old he's an old softy. People people don't realize that about <laughs> Dave. Um, you have anything else to say about Smash? Oh, I actually no, I should point out that obviously with the finish of this match, the idea would be that they would probably doing they're working on like a program, right? It would be Hogan and Warrior versus Sid versus Papa Shango. Yeah. And basically none of that happens. Nope. Hogan takes time off because the steroid trial pressure was um uh, you know, kind of heating up on him. Sid had failed a drug test before this match. He fails the drug test. And I know drug testing was relatively new to the WWF um, because of the steroid trial. So, so Sid tests positives for steroids, which it, I, it's really hard to believe if you look at him. He definitely doesn't look like somebody that's on <laughs> steroids. Um, so he fails the drug test and they basically like, well, you're going to do this match and then you're going to serve your suspension. And so after the match, when he's supposed to be serving a suspension, Sid just goes, ah, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. And he just quits, allegedly to go pursue a career in professional softball. Um, but he'd be in WCW by the end of the year. So you lose, Hogan's not around, Sid's not around. Warrior, you know, is around for a little bit, but he quits the company again um, later that year. And I believe that was the last time he quit the company before he comes back in the mid nineties. But so- yeah. So, like, you basically lose, uh, you know, Papa Shango is, I don't know when Papa Shango is repa- repackaged to Kama. I assume he's Papa Shango for a little bit longer, but I didn't look that up. But basically all the participants, like, in this WrestleMania main event, like, the idea of what we're building for the rest of the year are all gone from the promotion, like, within a few months. And so on that end, it's also a disaster in that the whole idea was to set up, like, this very successful long program between two heels and two top baby faces. And none of that comes to fruition for a variety of reasons. Yeah, uh, just one more thing, just one last thing to add. Um, They actually did a storyline with Papa Shango and Ultimate Warrior. Um, This is when, like, Papa Shango, like, I guess he cursed Ultimate Warrior and caused Warrior to, like, vomit convulsively, like, that weird storyline there. And so they did something with with that storyline there, but there's the weird, like, sort of 80s um, mystical um, sort of thing uh, between them. And, yeah, that was like the one thing they did with Papa Shango and Ultimate Warrior since, yeah, like you said, Hogan and Sid pretty much left the company um, soon after this match. Yeah, and Shango's really out of place when you look back and see, like, 
okay, we have Hogan and Warrior and Sid, who are pretty much three lifelong main event performers in yeah. the various promotions that they are in. And then like, oh, and Papa Shango, who's like a more like oddity WWE character in, you know, historically. Yes. It, it, it's like, you know, oh, Papa Shango, remember he had like the terrible, he was like an evil voodoo guy and he did like spooky magic and it was like regarded as this very bad gimmick. It's like to see him coming out in the WrestleMania main event, like basically hinging on his performance it, is something that has not aged particularly well. Um, so we're going to move on to our second match. This is Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg. This match, of course, is famous for the crowd at WrestleMania 20 at Madison Square Garden. You know, crapping all over it. You know, it's funny, Jason. I have been told that, um, and this is a very recent thing, is that social media and the internet has ruined professional wrestling because all of the, the fans think that they're the stars and they just crap all over everything. And that in the good old days, that never happened, especially pre-internet, which everyone knows pre-internet is like 2015, right? <laughs> Everything is like, like the internet definitely was not around in 2004, right? And so it's just kind of funny to go back 18 years for this match and see a match where basically every fan in attendance seems to know the backstage news behind the match and they crap all over it. And this is, uh, you know, Really, it's funny to watch in hindsight. I can imagine in time, it, 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 you know, if you're watching it in real time, it's incredibly disappointment, disappointing. And I have kind of a story about that. But it is, like you said, like you said, it starts out with that long test of strength, which lasts forever. It starts out with them doing nothing for, forever. This is only yeah. like a, I think it's like a 11 to 13 minute match. And it's so boring because it feels like <laughs> it goes like 30 minutes because they do just so little in this match. Uh, what were your kind of takeaways from the match? Uh, for, well, first, uh, the backstory of the match um, is more, I think it's more hilarious. Like, um, so basically, like, the, I think the initial idea um, was from the old observers um, was that it's supposed to be a, a WWE title match because at the time of the Royal Rumble, uh, Brock was WWE champion of SmackDown. Um, this is the time of the brand split. And so Goldberg was on Raw. And so I guess the idea was that Goldberg would eventually be drafted to SmackDown down to give them fresh matchups um and this was, you know, the, this was supposed to be a wwe title match but that eventually changed uh i know um at the royal rumble brock lesnar screws over goldberg um by just by interfering in the match and sort of helping um goldberg get eliminated and then eventually um stone cold steve austin gives goldberg a ticket to no way out so he can sit front row and he can interfere in the match with Eddie Guerrero and Brock Lesnar and helping Eddie, Eddie win the title uh, over there. And then the next uh, SmackDown after that, Brock Lesnar acknowledges that Eddie Guerrero took advantage of the situation and won the title. And he says, um, Eddie Guerrero stole my title. He actually says stole um, in his promo. And um, and, and he says that title was everything to me. He's really hyping up that the WWE title he lost is very, very important to him. But instead of asking for a rematch with Eddie Guerrero, which never happens, um, obviously because Eddie passes away um, soon after, but still, like they didn't really do a, a rematch ever um, in, the, in this following year. Um, he asks for a title, uh, asks for a match against Goldberg. And then on Raw, like Vince McMahon says, no, I'm not going to do the match for whatever reason. And Stone Cold, Steve Austin comes out and he's the one that has to initiate this match. And that's why he's inserted as a special guest referee, um, because that's always a fun uh, sort of look back upon. It's like, oh, Stone Cold is a special guest ref, because I guess um, at the, also at the time, WWF was trying to, WWE was trying to get um, Stone Cold back because, you know, um, business was kind of up and down, but mostly on the ups, but still they wanted Stone Cold back because they wanted a new star at least bring back the old stars because the new stars weren't really doing that um, at least well in WWE standards. Um, and so you have all that backstory there leading up to this match. And at first, you know, I, the, the crowd is kind of into Goldberg. You had Goldberg chants. And so um, it, what, it, the way the things were going, the entrances didn't really seem like it was the crowd was going to crap all over the match. But then eventually, you know, they did. And Brock Lesnar, he gives a smirk. Uh, when the fans are booing and right away I wrote in my notes Brock Lesnar is completely checked out like he is checked out of this match and that's why he um just stands around you know even Austin he can tell he's smirking when the fans are booing like he can tell like okay this is gonna be a disaster 
And, you know, they do the, the shoulder tackle um, sort of battle there, which is pretty much nothing for these guys. Um, and, you know, the fans still aren't really into anything here. And basically I wrote, um, you know, Goldberg Brock Lesnar unlock their finishers. Like it's a video game. Like they unlock their finishers and that's how the match ends. Like it's just the finishers just come out of nowhere. Yeah, he, so, so I want to, pers- on a personal note, uh, I did not, I was not watching wrestling at this point. I started watching wrestling pretty, you know, probably, I would say probably like late fall uh, 2005, four. So kind of like six or seven months after this event. Uh, so, you know, at that point, you know, Brock Lesnar is not in the company anymore because he leaves after this match. This is the last, him and Goldberg's last match in this company for a very long time until yep. they came back, you know, in the last decade. But uh, I got one of the, one of like the early ways I was introduced to wrestling was I got the um, WrestleMania 19 video game for GameCube. Yep. And uh, Brock Lesnar is like, you know, he's on the cover. He's prominently featured because WrestleMania 19 is a Brock Lesnar event. Uh, And he was my favorite character to be. And I was always like, why isn't this guy Brock Lesnar in WWE now? Um, and I eventually, you know, because I was able to get on the internet and saw like, oh, he, he quit. He's, he's trying to play for the Minnesota Vikings or now he's doing MMA. Uh, but I always thought Brock Lesnar was just cool. Uh, and a few years like later, I would get into, you know, more like wrestling. And I, I knew who, Go- I found out who Goldberg was. And I was like, wait, Goldberg and Brock Lesnar had this match at WrestleMania? Oh, that must be like an amazing match because I knew, you know, they're similar, they're really similar guys in a lot of ways. And I was like, oh, I got to see that match. So I eventually I got the WrestleMania 20 DVD. I must have rented it. And I was like, oh, time for Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg. And then I get this match. And I was just like totally disappointed to it as a kid. And I'm watching it like a few years after it happened. And it's just one of those things where it's like, I felt like in, in real time, like I was just so disappointed. I felt like it's funny to go to, in hindsight to be like, I was so excited to watch that match, knowing how infamous it would be for just being a complete nothing match. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's like they could have done this match. They, they wrestle this. I, it's such a bizarre match because they wrestle it in such a dumb, dumb way in the sense that they stand there and do nothing, which allows the crowd to shit all over it and it's like they could have just done like what their match at the next rest the next time they met at wrestlemania would be which would be like this like little 10 minute sprint where they just do their signature moves and then it's over and in that way the crowd probably wouldn't have had a chance to crap on it as much as they do but the fact that they basically do nothing for at least half of this match kind of showed like gave the crowd an opportunity to get in all their their bret hart chants and their you know, na 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 na, hey hey hey, goodbye. Like chance, like I basically just gave him cart to you know all this time to to do those kind of chants and stuff like that. It's really like poorly worked from that perspective. And he like said Brock Lesnar, like you say, he's checked out. You know, he 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 he's he was thrown off by the booing. He's only like what like two or three years into his wrestling career at this point, so he wasn't yeah. really like this experienced veteran to working in front of a crowd like that. Um, and it really un- undoes them. And, you know, like, it's not talked about as much, but, like, Brock Lesnar had, like, a lot of resentment for wrestling. It's not like he, he – it's very similar in some ways to, like, the way people talk about CM Punk. It was like, oh, he'll never come back. He hates wrestling. Like, that was totally true about Brock Lesnar. You know, he's totally changed that narrative of the last 10 years since he did come back to WWE. Uh, but this was, like, a, this is how he went out, which is not good, you know, before he came back. Yeah, along the opposite side of that, Goldberg had a very disappointing WWE run. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, the first time. Yeah, the first time. Yeah, like he, um, they, the Gold Dust put a wig on him one time on, on a backstage segment on Raw. Um, he, you know, WWE just, I mean, obviously, of course, you know, Goldberg is not Vince McMahon's creation, so he has no desire to, you know, push him until like he he does win the world title, but still, it's a very lackluster sort of run, you know, especially during this time, this is like 2004. And so um, this is peak reign of terror, Triple H as well. And so obviously he's got to be the main uh, champion. He was the, in the main events uh, here though, he does put over, you know, he and, he and Shawn Michaels, you know, um, and Chris Benoit put on a great uh, main events um, leading up to that. But still uh, for Goldberg, his run was very disappointing. And that's 
probably why he didn't want to resign his contract with WWE. You know, like I said earlier, you know, I guess the idea was they wanted to take him in SmackDown to help, you know, build some fresh matchups. But still, I think I don't think Goldberg was very interested, um, especially because of things didn't go well his way most of the time. Yeah, it's it's really funny um, with Brock. It's like he was so done with wrestling, and I think I think that that comes across in this match where he just doesn't really want to do that much. Yeah, and he just doesn't care at all. At one point, he yells super loud, "Come at me, motherfucker!" Like just like <laughs> everyone can hear it. Austin's just kind of chuckling in this in the in the background. He's like bemused by these guys. Um, it's just, it's just, it's a, such a bizarre match to watch. It's really, it's almost like they sh- they're shooting on each other. They don't because they cooperate when they actually do stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's almost like they're like, we don't know what we're supposed to do. So we're just going to stare at each other for a while, um, which is crazy because it's a WrestleMania. It's a big WrestleMania match. You should, you know, I'm sure they had a layout and stuff that they were to do. It's just weird to me that they, they went in the direction that they would. It, it's, it's, it's really something that, I can't recall another match that's really like it, to be honest. Yeah, I can't really think of any off the top of my head. It, commentary is very interesting as well. Like JR and Lawler, they're trying to sell the match. Like, oh, you know, I think J- uh, Lawler is kind of like, oh, you know, Brock Goldberg, Brock Lesnar, you know, they're, they're just so big, you know, that they just have to, you know, strategize and think about things, you know, uh, they, you know everyone wants to see them, you know, throw hands at each other, but, you know, that's not how it works for these big guys. You know, it's different yeah. for the heavyweights. You know, he's, try- he's trying really hard to sell uh, this match because, like, they're doing nothing. And it's like, and Lawler keeps like, oh, you know, just, just this soon, soon it's gonna something's gonna big is gonna happen any minute now. Something big is gonna happen, and Jr. is like, oh, you know, Brock Lesnar and Goldberg, you know, they're patiently waiting to you know attack one another, waiting for someone to make a big move. Yeah, they're putting it over as like a like this is a big strategic battle, and it's just these two guys staring at each other. Um, you know, they I will say the commentary like acknowledges like they say like oh the rumor about Brock Lesnar, you know, trying to play National Football right. League football, yeah. like they they you know. Lesnar had told WWE a few weeks before that he was leaving and that had been kind of reported everywhere. And so people knew that's where the crowd knew um, what was happening in this match. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's a very bizarre match. Like I said, you can't really compare it to anything else. It's really kind of funny to go back and look at it because of how different Brock Lesnar and Goldberg's careers have turned out to be. Um, I wonder if a match like this happened now, what people would say. Because uh, I think the way that even the way fans view the product now is so different. And especially when it comes to dealing with like, they're not as, um, at least WWE fans for the most part, like the vocal fans, it's not as um, like, uh, what's the right word? I don't want to say tribal. It's like, or entitled. It's kind of like, you know, we're com- there was a lot, of, we're coming off of the attitude era in this match. And there was, a, you know, kind of this attitude about, you know, being team WWE and you don't leave the company, you stay, stick around, you're not, you don't quit. Um, even though historically wrestling is full of people quitting and leaving companies and that's just kind of how the business works. There was this idea that like Brock Lesnar is an asshole because he's quitting and he's leaving and fuck him. Um, and I, I don't know if that, that would be the same today. Like, I think fans, like, don't care as much about, like, oh, if a guy is, like, leaving. Yeah, for sure. I think it definitely, it's very case by case, right? Like, I think, you know, it depends. Like, if, if the guy is, like, you know, out, an outspoken a-hole, then maybe people were like, oh, good, you know, get yeah. out of here. We don't watch you anymore. But, yeah, if it's, like, someone like a CM Punk, for example, like, people are very uh, on CM Punk's camp. Um, rather than WWE's camp, you know, for the most part, at least, you know, I, I, so it definitely is case by case, depending on who's leaving and their reasons for it and sort of their um, public image uh, for the fans, at least. I think it depends on that. Yeah, there's like the, the attitude of the fans is, I think, less entitled than it was in the past in the sense that if Brock Lesnar is like, I'm, which is the truth, I'm burned out. I don't want to wrestle anymore. I'm taking, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not coming back. I don't think, I think a lot of fans would be like, oh, that sucks that Brock burned out, but they wouldn't be like, you know, as blaming him for, for like quitting and giving up. I think in general, like 
society is a little bit more sympathetic to people like that than they were back in 2004. Um, and the fan base has changed at that end. Obviously now you would have like the rumors always going to AEW or, right. or something <laughs> like that. So it, it would be a little different on that end. And, and there you do see some entitlement where fans are like, oh, I hope he doesn't go to AEW because I'm team WWE. But for the most part, even then, I think, I don't think you would see this kind of negative reaction um, that's going out there. Do you have anything else to add or do you want to move on? Well, I guess to add to that uh, point, like Brock Lesnar was leaving from the NFL, right? And so I guess, you know, people are defensive about wrestling in general, right? Like they don't want to see it as lesser than other things. Like if you just leave for a different wrestling company, that you're, you're still part of wrestling. But I guess, yeah, like it's the idea is like, oh, Lesnar thinks wrestling's beneath him, right? The NFL is where it's at, you know, not pro wrestling. You know, pro wrestling is for the losers, yeah. right? I think maybe that's, that's true. part of the negativity. Yeah, which is that I'm done doing fake wrestling. I'm from real sports and I'm going to go do real sports. Yeah, exactly. And, and the fan base is different now. I think like fans now are less sensitive about people calling wrestling fake than they were, you know, 18 years ago. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, at, you know, Dave gave this one and a quarter star, which is probably fair. Um, he, he, Dave said that like this could have been a good match, but the crowd crapped all over it. And like with a better crowd, this would be like a, a decent match. I, I disagree with that. This, there's nothing to this match. Like if this match was happening in front of like just a typical regular crowd, like it's still a bad match. They don't do anything except hit their finishers at the very end. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe they had a different attitude for the match, maybe, but still, like I don't really see how else this could have been better. So we're gonna move on to the first Money in the Bank match, WrestleMania 21. I will say, Jason, that I had WrestleMania 21 on DVD as a kid. I have seen this event more than any other wrestling event by, by a wide margin. Um, so I know every single match by heart uh, on this, on this show. So I was very, very ready to, to talk about this one because I've seen this match so many times. Um, take us through like what your thoughts are on the match, I guess, from just a basic view. Yeah. I mean, so like, first of all, like this is, again, um, this is during time the brand splits. And so they were very um, more consistent with the brand split than they are nowadays. Like this is all raw superstars. Like there's no um, like brand integration like there mm -hmm. is nowadays, you know, and, and later money in the banks were like, oh, you have three from raw and three from SmackDown. Like, no, this is all just raw people. And like looking back on like the people in this match, you have Edge christian with tomko which is like, I, like oh, oh tomko i forgot christian was a tomko at the time uh, i was just like an enforcer kane is maskless kane like is like after the whole um what see no evil movie i guess or whatever like he takes his mask off and, and stuff shelton benjamin who is the intercontinental champion at the time um chris jericho and chris benoit and you know it, it's very interesting to look back on this match you know seeing that shelton benjamin was very over and it seemed like this was this was during the time where they actually cared about Shelton Benjamin and was like oh maybe he could be a future star for us one day like he all the highlight moments are Shelton Benjamin like he gets all the best moments other than like the Chris Benoit headbutts um off the ladder you know that's the best that's, that's the best moment of the match but Shelton Benjamin has the more um highlight moments of the match here uh because you know I, I, I'm assuming at the time they actually thought he could be a future main eventer at least that's the Im image I got. Yeah, it's kind of sad watching Sel Shelton in this match for the exact reason you laid out, which is that he's kind of the person that they think um, like can be a big star. He's the youngest guy, I think, in the in the match. Yeah. Um, he's the Intercontinental Champion. It does feel like his stock is on the rise. He gets a lot of the cool spots, and it's kind of sad watching this match. And it's like, God damn it, Shelton Benjamin was so good, and they never were sincere about pushing him that far. Um and it makes me mad that like the, the way, not that his career is like this disappointment or anything, um, but it makes me sad because I wish that they pushed him with more consistency than they did because you can see the potential. And um, in this match, I was thinking about this, like with the Money in the Bank match, this is about, you know, when was the last time WWE invented like a really cool match? Because if you think about this time period, you have Money in the Bank and you have the Elimination Chamber both kind of come into fruition as, as, um, as a kind of specialty matches that the company has invented. Obviously, they did the Hell in a Cell match, you know, in 1997. But 
you know, WWE went through this phase where they invented these kind of cool new match types that would become staples. And I was thinking like, when was the last time that they ever did that? Um, I guess you could, someone say, could say like, well, they did the cinematic matches, which is true. But I was kind of made me like, I was like, oh man, you're right. They don't like innovate anymore with match types. It's kind of just the same, um, you know, okay, this year it's Money in the Bank. We're having a Money in the Bank match. It's Hell in a Cell. We're going to have a Hell in a Cell match. Uh, it's Elimination Chamber. We're going to have an Elimination Chamber match. You know, it's the Royal Rumble. We're doing the Royal Rumble. Like they don't, um, you know, TLC match, another one, obviously, uh, it's kind of similar in a lot of ways to the, the, the Money in the Bank match, but it's kind of like, when, when is the last time WWE came up with like a new match that like became like a staple? Yeah, it's probably just this time, 2005. Yeah, like other than that, they just do like variations of a match, right? They just add in small wrinkles to already established matches. Uh, but other than that, yeah, like they don't really invent something new for this match. Um, which is kind of interesting. Like, I guess um, on a previous edition of Talk is Jericho, like Jericho said, like the original idea was to do a submission match between him, Edge, and Benoit. And then everyone else in the match would be in, be in a ladder match. But I guess, you know, eventually this idea of Money in the Bank uh, came up just to have everyone else in the match together. So that's kind of interesting that like that what if scenario that this could, could have been a regular ladder match with like, I guess, maybe still a contract up for grabs, I guess. Um, but still, like, yeah, it's kind of interesting that like, you know, that would have been a scenario where that, that could have happened. Yeah, um, you know, you mentioned like there's a ton of star power in this match. A lot of that I think has to do with just the depth of the roster was so was so great. And you have pretty much everyone with the exception of Shelton, uh, you know, were like pretty established guys within the company, obviously Jericho, um, had main event at WrestleMania 18, and Benoit had WrestleMania, WrestleMania main evented WrestleMania the year before. In some ways, this is like a step down from Benoit. He's kind of oh, just yeah. a guy. Yeah. Um, after winning the title, in, you know, in the main event of WrestleMania next year, he's just like a guy in a ladder match, called that the Kofi Kingston role. Yeah. Um. But yeah, you know, guy Christian Edge. Um. Obviously, they were kind of already established stars. Kane, you know, obviously a big star. Um. And then Shelton, who's like the guy on the rise, it does feel like it's not just like, ah, here, it's not like they just have some guys who they didn't, they need to get on the card. So they're going to be in this match or they needed some guys who might be able to do cool stuff off ladder. So they threw them in. It does feel like there's a lot of credibility and star power in this match, which is good because the idea of the money in the bank match is that the person who wins it is going to become the champion. Um, and so you want to have people that already kind of have a certain sense of credibility so they feel like they can win the match because if you have people who you can't envision as champion they're probably not going to like be very interesting in money in the bank because we don't think they're the fans will not believe that they can win the match um i was thinking uh when i was watching you know one of the things that stood out to me was that the entrances are quick yep and i get so used to wwe now especially at wrestlemania where the entrance is so long because everyone wants to have their big grand entrance and they got to walk down the super long uh ramp to get because they're in the stadium this one i just the guys come out you know they get a pop when their music hits and they watch the ring and you know kane has the special entrance with the ladders are on fire which is cool but doesn't really take up any extra time and i was like this is great because i hate how long entrances take now there's so much downtime on, on wwe shows and i was like i wish that they would come out with this kind of pace and i know other people like the spectacle of the cool entrances and stuff like that and maybe that's fine for the main event but i did like that this was just kind of they were in and out where the match was started pretty quickly after you know the announcement of the match was made yeah i mean the match pretty much starts with like everyone attacking kane right away and i think those quick entrances really helped the crowd like the crowd was just eating everything up right from the get-go and i think maybe doing the quick entrances helps get the crowd really into this match you know obviously again you had the star power of the match but even if you didn't like you start off right away with the big dives um you know shot the benjamin does his um big dive and kane even gets up on the top rope and dives in everyone as well like you had just a lot of great um things going on you have the edge of christian call back you know them sandwiching kane with the ladders um shelton benjamin even got shelton chance like i don't even remember the last time i heard shelton benjamin actually get chance um and that's you know very earnest sort of manner um and obviously like yeah the, um the, the, they have the 
everyone gets on the ladder below the briefcase and crashes and burns cliche, which you see in every Money in the Bank ladder match, where everyone has to get up on the top of a ladder. They have to all stand together, all below the, the briefcase, and then everyone just crashes and burns, ending with the uh, Shelter Benjamin T-Bone suplex on edge, which is like, <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah, it's one of those things. So this would have been, you know, the, the Hardys, Edge, and Christian and Dudley matches were kind of the predecessors to the Money in the Bank match in the sense of yep. this big multi-man ladder match where guys are doing all sorts of crazy stunts. And, you know, that match had had, the last time that had happened would be WrestleMania 17. So it had been three or four years since fans kind of saw this kind of match. And they're super into it. Every, you know, part of it is that you got, you know, big stars like Jericho and Benoit and Kane and, and those kind of people are in the match doing it. And so fans are obviously going to be a little bit more invested in that. But, you know, a lot of the stuff they do, like you said, now you see it. It's like, oh, it's the cliche spot. But a lot of it is like kind of the first time a lot of fans yep. um, were seeing stuff like that. And so it does come across really a crowd super hot for it. And so, and, and it's great because everyone's always into the spots. I, I always said that this was the best money in the bank match i don't really know if that's true anymore simply because i've lost count of like how many they've had um i used to be like you know know, six or seven years ago you could rank them and say okay the one at wrestlemania this was 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 good the one at wrestlemania 23 was good like you can kind of go through the wrestlemanias and remember them and now there's just like so many of them there's like two on some shows you got the women's ones like I, i i can't even remember which one's the best but this to me will probably always be the best a because I associate it with my childhood because I saw it yeah. so many times, but B, I just think it's a really good match. You know, Dave gave it, gave it four and a half stars. I totally agree. This is a pretty much a perfect match for what it needed to be. It's not super long. Everyone gets their spot to shine. Um, they do such a good job, you know, like with edge winning it and he kind of steals it from um, Benoit who, who, who deserve, who was like seen as like the deserved winner because of the effort that he put in. And, you know, they do a good job with the whole gimmick, which is why the Money in the Bank gimmick continues to work as a drawing card because Edge won it the first time and he held on to it for a long time. He used it and he won the title like in a very opportunistic way months later. And everything about it is pretty much perfect for, for from an execution standpoint. Yeah, I was trying to look um, at the, the sort of the history behind this i couldn't really find anything concrete of like did they know when edge was supposed right. to cash in i couldn't really find anything concrete on that but yeah he does eventually cash in um at new year's Re- revolution or whatever that pay-per-view is called on, on new year's eve new year's day on john cena and yeah it de- definitely sets up edge well i mean this is something you talked about before how like money in the bank was actually a meaningful thing and it really did do a good job of building new stars uh, especially for Edge, you know, establishing him as a main eventer. Um, that was like my peak years of watching WWE, the Edge John Cena feud um, over there. And yeah, it kind of illustrates, um, you know, how this match can be done very well. Like I, like you mentioned it, like how, like this was a very quick match and really felt that way. The pace was perfect and it, di- it didn't overstay its welcome, which I feel like sometimes Money in the Bag matches kind of do feel that way since, you know, there's been so many, you have to, you know, kind of went up the ante um, every year. And so I guess that was the benefit of this match. This was the first match. They kind of could do whatever they wanted. And, you know, the only precedent was the, tri- the triple threat met ladder matches in the past. And so there wasn't really much else to one up compared to nowadays where like you have to put people through two ladders. You got to put in tables. You got to, you know, jump off this high ladder, you know, all, all these sort of things that you kind of have to do to sort of make your match memorable. Uh, for you know fans who've seen these kind of matches uh, for like over 10 years yeah it's, that's what's one of the things that's kind of hard to look at but i think it still holds up you know the moves oh, are yeah, still sure. cool like shelton yeah. running up the ladder is still cool yeah that's, um, that's the thing about it is benoit um which is you know whenever you're watching a chris benoit match especially a match that involves him doing like moves that you associate with head trauma comes with a a, a kind of unease when you're watching it but like goddamn, he's so good. Like you mentioned the headbots headbutt spot. Like he's so good in this match when I'm watching it because you know he fight. He first of all they do this whole thing where like his his um his arm is like you know crushed in the ladder. So he, he's selling his arm the entire match. He can't do anything with the arm, and he's he's you know he's fighting Kane, who's like the great you know monster figure in the match, and he climbs up to the top of the ladder. 
um the very top of the ladder he's not on the he's not on like the top like uh wrong or the last wrong he's standing at the very top the pinnacle of the ladder and he does the diving headbutt and the crowd's going crazy and he's got this image of he's just given his entire body for the match and he does the diving headbutt and he sells it like he is like he just did the dumbest thing in the world because he's yeah. super injured <laughs> and he looks right into the camera and he's got he had stitches on his head his stitches come undone so now he's bleeding yep. and he's just screaming and then it's like it's it's just such a great spot and then of course he's climbing up the ladder he's still holt nurse in his arm he's like i was like battering he's he's like totally battered he's trying to climb up the ladder and of course edge comes in like an asshole and hits him with the steel chair and then climbs and steals the briefcase and it's just it's so well laid out it's really it's like i said it's the perfect match for what it needs to be yeah exactly you have the sympathy heats for benoit at the end you know people are like oh yo benoit almost had it and then you have the uh, perfect amount of heel heat for edge uh for just uh, coming in you know especially during that time he was like billed as the u- ultimate opportunist and so really fits within that moniker uh during that time as well yeah and you know it, it, there's some clearly some real thought put into like the layout of the match and like how yep. what kind of stories they were going to tell within the match and uh not to sound like an old guy but now it just feels like they just do spots yeah um and it, it just doesn't have that same kind of um and like i said it's, the concept's been watered down and it, you know the money in the bank if you're going to do the gimmick every year it was always going to have an expiration date as far as like people were kind of going to get less interested in seeing it the fact that they kind of devalued world titles and the world title reigns also doesn't also hurts the concept of the match but in this time it's perfect um you have anything else you want to add uh nope uh we can move on okay so we will move on to our last match and this is i would say easily the like least known match that we're going to talk about in some ways makes it you know more interesting because i was kind of i had totally kind of forgotten about the match um, even though I know I've seen it before, because I know I've, I've only seen WrestleMania 26 once. Yep. I saw it like on DVD when it like probably a few months after the event happened. I did not watch it live. That was the only time I ever saw it. Like, I don't, I remember, you know, I remember John Cena versus Batista and I remember Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels, you know, two as, as the main event. I totally forgot about this match. Um, and so when I was watching it, it was the thing that struck out to me on it was that the company had spent um, like a year or so with this whole legacy angle, which is that, you know, Randy Orton is, is, you know, really this monster heel kind of character where he dominated the world title and he had these, you know, group of henchmen that were like these young up and comers that he had taken under his wing that were also, um, you know, second and third generation wrestlers and that they had, you know, they were with him for a while and they were doing this big blow off angle where, you know, this is the mentor and the mentees were now going to feud with each other. And it was kind of felt like it was to be like this major main event angle and this big push for Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase Jr. And it's just not, it's, uh, it's the second match on the show. It's not that long. Orton beats these guys then they stop then there's no follow-up to the feud they go all their separate ways it's a it's kind of like really disappointing in hindsight to look at like they had done this legacy thing for so long and they just kind of blow it off with like a a one-off match you know i guess it's at wrestlemania so it feels like it's important just because it's at wrestlemania but does feel like they just kind of moved on from this very quickly and this is kind of like a nothing match given that it had like an over year-long build if you consider the entire time legacy was together yeah, I mean, the idea of the legacy staple was, you know, something that interests me a lot, you know, like I'm a comic book fan, I always like legacy characters in those, you know, like your Robins, your uh, Superboys and stuff there. And so having a stable of legacy wrestlers, you know, uh, obviously, um, well, it, it, initially it was off to a bumpy start because along with um, Rhodes and DiBiase Jr. Yes. and Reddy Orton, you also had uh, Manu, who is, I guess, the forgotten Anawahi family member. Uh, he is like the uh, son. There's a few of those. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of them, uh, to, to, be, to be quite frank. Uh, he is the son of Afa, and he's like the younger brother of Samu. And you also have Sim Snuka, um, who the year prior um, was like a cameraman um, who like failed to catch under- Undertaker on his uh, to- tope uh, kanhilo. Um and so that was not a good start. For- that was not a good um, showing for him. And, you know, I think 
obviously like they got cut out because one they weren't really that good in the ring and they kind of interfered with the aesthetic of legacy like they weren't chiseled or had six packs on you know uh, on them unlike cody rhodes and teddy dibiase and so they were quickly um shunned out but you know they had, kind of had a decent run um you know obviously you know cody and ted, ted won the the tag titles and you know they were um fairly well established but i guess yeah um very soon after during this year during the build-up to this feud Cody and Ted uh, DiBiase um, they uh, turned on Randy Orton and sort of trying to establish themselves and so the psychology of this match is very strange where Randy Orton is coming in as the baby face everyone is all in Randy Orton and during the entrances Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase get like no reaction. There's no heel heat on them. No one cares about any of them because WWE, you know, shocker, failed to, you know, develop these younger guys into any sort of personalities. Um, you know, they're basically just, you know, generic sort of wrestlers, even though obviously, especially for Cody's case, he would go on to be uh, one of the big stars of the industry. But, you know, looking at this match, there's no very little evidence of that here, especially in his uh, entrance theme for Cody. Yeah, when you mentioned like the physiques and everything like that, it's, it's a, in Vince's mind and WWE's mind, like Randy Orton is the perfect WWE wrestler from like an aesthetic standpoint. It's like what they want their wrestler to be is they want him to be Randy Orton. And so it's very clear like Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase is like, let's find some guys that look like Randy Orton and push them. And obviously they found two of them. And like you said, they had a long run. Like they, these guys, you know, they had feuded with, with, with DX and Triple H and Shawn Michaels over the tag titles. Like they had... They were like not just random guys on the roster at this point. They had been guys who had worked some main event programs, um, obviously kind of under the tutelage of, of Orton and associated with Orton, who was the star of the act. But this was, it seemed like an idea. It's like, we're going to really push these young guys. And at some point they just like, actually, these guys aren't that good. Let's just have Randy Orton beat him at WrestleMania and then we'll move on, which is what happens. Orton beats both of these guys. Um, and they feel like, just, you know, like, like, like Jags out there, like Cody has this music when he comes out because they come out individually and Cody has this music. It's just like this, the most generic, like rock music, a little yeah. bit of Southern rock tinge to it. But it's like, and I'm like, this guy looks like a job. He gets his jobber music and he's just coming out. And like he said, no reaction. The match is all about Randy Orton. It's, um, they're you know they're most of it is you know DBS and Cody are, are working together they're a seamless unit and then of course they have a little dissension towards the end which allows Randy Orton to take advantage and win but like even like the, when they're like beating down Randy Orton like they're just like punching him it's like ah we're just gonna punch and kick him and they're, they're doing Randy Orton moves like they're doing the Garvin stomps which I don't even think Orton does anymore um no but they're just it's just kind of like okay these guys are beating up Randy Orton and then you know, they do the kind of Cody goes for a moonsault and Ted covers him while Cody's like has his back turned and then Cody gets mad. It's like, oh, I'm going to hit my moonsault. You're just trying to steal my spotlight, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then they kind of get in a fight and then Orton gives them both RKOs and he punts Cody. I hated the punts. I want to say that too. I think that was one of the stupidest things in wrestling history. The, the move itself? Yeah, just like this idea that like he kicks a guy in the head oh, and yeah, it, it's like this devastating move and Vince yeah. McMahon's like comatose for a year because Randy <laughs> Orton punted him and like it always, first of all, it always looked like shit. They yes. couldn't show it because he couldn't actually kick the guy in the head and it yeah. never made any sense. Like so many guys kick people in the head all the time. Randy Orton, why? Because he gets a running start and he punts the guy. Like I just, I always thought it was stupid. People always say like, oh, it's this amazing move. It's so cool. Like, and I get like heel Orton was cool during that time period. It's probably the peak of his career. But, um, like, just, like, I hated the punt. I, every time he went for it, I was like, this is so dumb. Like, I just always thought it was stupid. Um, and he does it in this match. And the camera, like, shakes away from it as soon as, yeah. like, as, so you can't <laughs> see that he actually misses him. Um, and just, like, of all, like, the cool finishing moves, we're going to, it's going to be a guy running and kicking him, like, Charlie Brown trying to kick a football. <laughs> is, is, you know, I, I never liked that. Um. But yeah, it just feels like their guys are just such afterthoughts in this match. And it kind of shows like, you know, Cody obviously tried very hard, but his career never took off in WWE the way he wanted to. I mean, in some ways, I think t in this match, Ted DiBiase looks better than Cody. Like he seems like he comes across as more aggressive, but 
you know, his career never amounted to anything in WWE. He just didn't have charisma. Um, and it, it, it's one of those things. It's like, you know, after this match, after this match, Randy Orton just, you know, he goes on, he gets in like this long world title program. Um, he was feuding with John Cena again. I think Cody gets drafted to SmackDown. So like even Cody and Ted don't, even though this is supposed to, you would think that they would feud after this, just them two, but they don't even do that. They just go away. Cody kind of drifts along aimlessly for a few months and he comes up with the, the dashing Cody Rhodes gimmick is the first of many attempts to try to differentiate himself. But this, what this match emphasized was just how little WWE seemed to care about Rhodes and DiBiase after presumably thinking that they were going to be big stars and just kind of giving up on them really for no reason. Yeah, exactly. It's for no reason. I mean, they tried uh, to do something at Teddy, Teddy Biasi. You know, they gave him the million dollar belts. They brought back Virgil. Um, they had Maurice with him. But like, like you said, he had no charisma. It never worked. Like he, um, he just didn't have it. Like obviously like the look and his in-ring skills, like they were fine. Uh, but yeah, it just wasn't the complete package over there. And yeah, for Cody, like, you know, his career is, his career tra- trajectory is very interesting in WWE. And it's even more interesting now that he's coming back, presumably coming back. I mean, he hasn't debuted yet uh, as of this recording. Maybe, well, tonight at SmackDown, maybe not. But, you know, like, it's kind of interesting that he's going to come back to WWE after what was, you know, a very mixed bag run in his initial run here where, like, yeah, they gave him generic entrance music. I guess, I don't know, maybe in fairness, like, the, the split happened you know, the couple months before that, and he came still came out the legacy Tyantron. And so I guess they didn't have anything for him. But I guess the fact that they didn't have anything for him at this time maybe speaks a lot more uh, to that over there. But yeah, you know, for Cody, it was just, you know, it, it he was still fighting himself. It's because of the, the in-ring work, like it was just generic stomps and, you know, punches and all that there. He did a, a moonsault. I tried a moonsault, but that was really it to the extent. You know, there was no Cody Cutters. There was no Crossroads, you know, anything like that you see now. Yeah, I don't even, like, I don't think he's, like, gr- even though he just doesn't have that much years of experience, like, I don't know if he's, like, green because we had yeah. seen these guys wrestle big matches before. It wasn't like yeah. they were making their debut in this match and they didn't come across well. It's kind of like, it feels like almost like even though, they're getting like the big match against Randy Orton and it's supposed to be a like um like a really big match for them it could just kind of feels like a step down like you can go back I want to say it was maybe the original Hell in a Cell pay-per-view that was before this but they wrestle DX in Hell in a Cell like a pretty good match and like it's like a major match I think it went like 30 minutes it was the main event of that show like they had main evented a pay-per-view already as a team you know just them two not really you know, Orton wasn't in that match. So it's like they had already kind of been at a certain level and it feels like in this match, they're just guys and they would proceed to, to, to be that after the fact. And I think they were higher on DiBiase um, after the match. And if you watch the match, you kind of get the impression that DiBiase is better than Cody. Um, obviously that's not true. You know, it was, that would have been a bad idea, but you know, at, at one point, you know, when they start finally start, when they kind of start fighting each other and start punching each other, Matt Stryker calls, he's like, this is, this could be a future WrestleMania main event, which is really funny to listen to him say that. It's like, yeah, I don't think Ted DiBiase Jr. is going to be main eventing any WrestleManias. And up until very recently, I would have said Cody is definitely not main eventing any WrestleManias, but we'll see what happens. Um, oh yeah, no, uh, Dave gave it to two and three quarter stars i think that's probably fair it's not like terror it's not bad like in the sense that the work is bad or anything like it's a it's a well executed match um which is kind of what you would expect in a randy orton match but it also doesn't really move the needle at all and that's why it's kind of like almost like it's a very forgettable match even though i think it probably could have been like a big blow off yeah this match definitely could have been bigger um than it was but yeah it kind of just petered off after that i mean i guess there was a small reunion of Cody and uh, DiBiase. They teamed up on an episode of SmackDown against Sin Cara and uh, Daniel Bryan, uh, Bryan Danielson now. But yeah, just a hilarious reason to return. Yeah, I, that is funny. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if it's that match. I, I think maybe that's the match where like, you know, the whole meme, the botch media meme where like, um cody tells that story like where ted's like where's that referee you know <laughs> he, he tried to fuck on me uh, there's an impression of ted DiBiase during that time uh over there but yeah that's it's very surprising that like there's no 
um, follow up to this. They kind of just like, okay, we're going to split these guys up, forget about whatever they did together. Um, you know, we're not going to mention anything. We're just doing one small reunion, but that's really it. Yeah, you look back at like, so like five years before this event, you have the kind of the, the split of evolution, which at least from the Batiste angle was done very well in the sense that, you know, Triple H had this group of, of younger wrestlers, mainly Batiste and Randy Orton, helping him out, kind of learning under him. That was the whole idea. It was like this evolution of the business, the past and the present and the future with, between Flair, Triple H, Batista and Orton. And you have the big, you know, the way evolution kind of dissolves, at least from Batista's end, is, you know, he rises up and he finally beats Triple H and he wins the title and, you know, he's a big main event star. And it's this major, major deal. They have, you know, they main event at WrestleMania. They main event like two more pay-per-views after that. They do the, they made it a backlash and they have the, the Hell in a Cell match later that year. And he, that's kind of how I would use as like a model. Of like, okay, we had a year long heel stable between kind of like two generations of talents. Let's, you know, let's, how are we going to split them up? How are we going to do it? And this legacy would be kind of like not what you would do, which is we just split them up and eh, they went their separate ways and that's it. It wasn't like, didn't feel major at all. It didn't feel like important at all. And I think that's kind of like a shame when you consider how much time and energy had been spent over the previous year building them up. Yeah, I guess like it just goes into like, you know, WWE's unwillingness to sort of have Randy Orton take a step down. Like you mentioned, like you mentioned earlier, like Orton would just go on to have a feud with John Cena for the WWE title. And I guess, you know, they didn't really think like Cody or Ted could go up against a John Cena, which I guess it's kind of true with Ted DiBiase's standpoints, but maybe Cody, you know, could have had, you know, went toe to toe with John Cena, especially if he did that dashing gimmick along with that. Maybe that could have worked. Um, but yeah, I guess it's just WWE, they wanted to, you know, have Randy Orton push for, what well, Randy Orton push for the title. And then also this is like, what, 2010? And so like later on that year, like ne ne Nexus would debut as well. And so like they had Wade Barrett's coming in, um, you know, as a potential young star as well. But again, Randy Orton would win the title um, against Ray, ba Ray Barrett, ironically enough. And so like, yeah, like the whole year was just more for Randy Orton push more than anything else. Right, that's my takeaway too, is that they looked at this match and they saw, okay, let's use it as an opportunity to further like give Randy Orton a win yeah. as opposed to from approaching it as a way of like, let's use Randy Orton's star power to help get someone else over. I feel like if you, even today now you watch the Orton and Riddle segments and it's like, who takes the pinfalls in most of their matches? It's Riddle. And yep. it's like, you would think that this would be a way to get, especially because that's like almost 10 years after this event. Um, and the, but the philosophy is still the same, which is let's kind of protect Randy Orton and he'll be with this guy that can eat pins for him. And it's not necessarily like, let's use Orton's star power to help Matt Riddle get over. And it's so, you know, even though we're, we're far beyond that stage where it's probably like, you know, we got to we got to make some new guys. It's still like, okay, how can we protect Randy Orton? And that's not something unique to Randy Orton. It's it's similar to a lot of the talent that WWE has had and their unwillingness to kind of push new guys. You know, as top stars. And I think Cody and Ted are are really just two victims of it. I mean, I wonder if you know, you said like, okay, like could Ted DiBiase Jr. really like face go on and feud with John Cena? looking at his career in wrestling post that it's, it's probably not, it's probably not true, but maybe if things broke for him differently um, he, and he was given more credibility as a, as a competitor, that could have, that could have been a, a viable thing to do. I think, I don't think WWE is wrong to spot him and say, this guy's got talent because I think he did have natural talent, yeah. um, but he wasn't, he didn't have the charisma and he wasn't put in, in position to be a star really. Um, and then this is kind of the end. This is, I mean, this is the end for his real career in WWE as far as like, as soon as like Cody at least had the Intercontinental Championship run and he, you know, the Stardust thing got him over a little bit and the, the team with Goldust and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, obviously post WWE had a, had a great career, but for Ted, like, you know, as soon as he's done with legacy, like, do you ever have to think about Ted DiBiase Jr.? Um, unless you're, uh, you know, uh, donating money in, in, in the state of Mississippi. <laughs> probably not. So, um, you know, for him, this is probably, this is the peak of his career for sure. His WrestleMania match against Randy Orton. Yeah. 100%. Like after that, um, didn't really do much. 
Uh, but for Cody, you know, um, basically had to leave WWE after um, his other singles match. Um, one of his few singles matches, uh, WrestleMania against Big Show, he left and, you know, became the Cody of today. And he, um, you know, has got to come back um, soon, uh, presumably for a WrestleMania match. And I'm curious what are your thoughts on this, Jesse. Like, do you think a legacy, would you want to see a legacy stable today? And I was kind of, I was kind of taking a peek at the roster. I'm like, okay, what if Cody started his own stable? Like, like sort of similar to legacy because I guess, you know, you, you have like, what Dominic Mysterio, you have um, the people that over at NXT, you know, like what role Turnbull or whatever, uh, obviously you have a uh, Braun breaker, but I, guess, I think they want to make him a single star. Um, but I guess, would you want to see something like this in the modern day? Maybe if Cody leading his own legacy stable. Yeah, it's interesting. Cause look, if I'm WWE, I have no idea if they're going to do this. My guess would be, they're not going to do it because it would require competency. Yeah. But like you got to bring Cody in, you got to push him like really fucking hard because you need new top stars. You desperately need guys with credibility. You're bad at establishing that on your own roster and building people up. At least with Cody, you can take someone who has created his own credibility elsewhere and can come in and the fans will buy as a big star coming in as long as he's presented as one. If he's not presented as one, he'll be right back to where he was before he left the company, which is just kind of like a mid-card guy. Um, so yeah like if you put him in the randy orton role and you have like this year-long thing where he's you know the world champion for a while and he's helping these other guys along i think that'd be a great use of his of his of his um time and his talent i would look at the roster and say who do we have to put in that role um i have so little faith in like nxt's like in the performance center's like ability to develop talent that Outside of Braun Breaker, I look at those second generation guys that they have, like Cal Bloom. Um, and I'm like, are these really like the people that we feel like can be potential future main eventers? And do we think that they should be pushed on television kind of like that? Um, like you said, like Dominic Mysterio, I'm like, no. <laughs> like I wouldn't want to see <laughs> yeah, Dominic that's Mysterio fair. and Cody like in a lot yeah. of tag matches with each other. Um but could you pick maybe, maybe not, maybe it doesn't have to be legacy. You know, maybe it can just be some younger guys in the roster that you're trying to push. Um, I don't know. There's guys like, I don't even know, like breaker is obviously one Grayson Waller, maybe as well. Like as far as like younger guys that you want to establish, we'll see what Gable Stevenson does. I think he's still probably a little bit of ways away from us really having any idea of what he can do as a professional wrestler, but in, in, in a W or sorry, in WWE, I just, I don't know, like who are they like under 25, under 28 talents that really would benefit that, that should be elevated to the next level. I just, I, I don't really know that because I'm not impressed by most of the people in NXT. Um, so I don't really know who I would pair him with, but I do like at least conceptually the idea of Cody kind of like in that Randy Orton role. Yeah, I mean, you have guys who have pretty much lost their credibility, but like uh, Angel Garza, Humberto Carrillo, right. yes. like those are like those guys, like those are generational type wrestlers, but like, you know, WWE has kind of already squandered uh, whatever momentum they could have. You know, they're basically either in the undercard on main events or in the 24 seven division. Like they aren't really doing much, but I guess if you want to make an earnest run um, to elevate them, maybe pairing up Cody, maybe Cody uh, get help, you know, elevate those guys and another level uh, perhaps. Um, but yeah, those are the only guys, other, other guys that I've thought of uh, in terms of the male, male talent. Yeah, that's, you know, that, and you got to be delicate with that for what I said about Cody, like you want him to be established as like a main event guy. Yeah, that's the thing. Do you slot him with people who are decisively not main event talent? Do you put yeah. him with, with Angel Garza or T-Bar um, <laughs> or these people that fans have been taught to think of at a certain level, which is not very high? And expect them to, to, to kind of elevate Cody. I, I think, yeah, I mean, WWE could use like a real stable that has some bite to it. Like they do, they'll do stables like they do retribution or they'll do um, tag teams and things like that. But I'm trying to think, or I guess like, like I guess like you could say like, um, you know, Roman Reigns and the Usos 
would be like a like a real main event kind of stable um but i i think that like a real like kind of um you know like a if you look at aw like an inner circle style group that kind of is is you know they got the world champion and they've got other competent people around him i think that, that could benefit wwe in a lot of ways and i'd like to see a sincere attempt at it for sure and maybe cody is the guy to lead that I mean, Science. they they had her business, but they just yes, you know. her business would be a good. But her business again was like almost in a similar way, which is like it's Bobby Lashley and exactly. then guys with no credibility. Yep, and that's a problem because there's a lot of people on WWE's roster who have no credibility. So you almost have to start from scratch with guys from NXT. But uh, maybe you sign some AEW guys <laughs> and put them in Cody's stable together. That would actually make the most sense. But I don't know whose contracts would be up and who would be available. Maybe that's why he hasn't debuted yet. Because that's what they're waiting on. They're waiting for a couple of other contracts to uh, expire, and they're going to have Cody lead an AEW stable, which would be funny if it's just kind of like random AEW people, and they just do it because they're from AEW, and it doesn't make any sense that like Cody is in a, he's in like leading a stable with like Joey Janela, and <laughs> like so, so, so Sunny Kiss, yeah, Sunny Kiss, like, yeah, like just people who have become uh like available outside of um of AEW. Um, all right. I think that's it. I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, this is kind of an atypical show, but I think it came across well, perhaps we'll pursue something in the future, maybe with some other major events like SummerSlam coming up in the future. Um, maybe we'll do a G1 one. That'll be fun. Just some random G1 matches. Those will actually be funny because there's a lot of random G1 matches out there. Um, but we'll keep in touch and we will see everyone again in two weeks post WrestleMania. Maybe we'll have some spicy WrestleMania takes Jason. Yeah, perhaps. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everyone, for listening, and we will see you later.